Wouldn't it be nice to have several thought leaders in your industry know and love your brand? Start a podcast. Invite your industry's thought leaders to be guests on your show. And start reaping the benefits of having a network full of industry influencers. Learn more at sweetfishmedia.com. You're listening to B2B Growth, a daily podcast for B2B leaders. We've interviewed names you've probably heard before, like Gary Vaynerchuk and Simon Sinek, but you've probably never heard from the majority of our guests. That's because the bulk of our interviews aren't with professional speakers and authors. Most of our guests are in the trenches leading sales and marketing teams. They're implementing strategy. They're experimenting with tactics. They're building the fastest growing B2B companies in the world. My name is James Carberry. I'm the founder of Sweetfish Media, a podcast agency for B2B brands, and I'm also one of the co-hosts of this show. When we're not interviewing sales and marketing leaders, you'll hear stories from behind the scenes of our own business. We'll share the ups and downs of our journey as we attempt to take over the world. Just kidding. Well, maybe. Let's get into the show. Welcome to the B2B Growth Podcast. I am Carlos Hidalgo, CEO of Vision CX and author of The Un-American Dream. And you are listening to the hashtag H2H, human to human segment. I am absolutely delighted to have as my guest today, Michael Brenner. I have known Michael for almost a decade. Uh, Michael, I apologize for that, uh, (laughs) that you've had to put up with me for that long, but welcome to the show. Thanks so much. I can't believe we knew each other when we were 12. Exactly right. right. Exactly yeah. right. Thanks for that. The, the, uh, the check is on its way. So for those, Michael, you, you've made quite a name for yourself in the B2B space. And of course, this is a B2B growth focused podcast. But for those people who've been either new to B2B or have been living under a rock for the past 12 years in this space, give a little background about yourself. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, you know now that I am getting along in years, it, it takes a little longer than I'd like to to give a background. But long story short, started in sales before moving into marketing with the Nielsen Company. Spent almost a decade there. Was head of marketing for a couple of uh, market research firms, technology startups. Uh, spent. Uh, just about seven and a half years with SAP as their first head of digital marketing, first head of content marketing. Uh, Then I headed out to uh, the content technology space and ran a strategy uh, team, uh, built a million dollar practice and and then went out on my own just about four years ago uh, and have been teaching brands, you know, especially in B2B that... uh, uh, focusing on their humanity, their expertise, uh, and and trying to shy away from the natural tendency to want to promote and sell uh, is really the best way to grow your business, gain new customers, and and you know get loyalty in the long run. Excellent. Well, I kind of feel in many ways I've had a a front row seat to your career, and at one point we actually talked about potentially working together in a, in when I was in a different company. I'm still kind of bummed that that never happened, but uh, thrilled to have you on the podcast. And you have uh, you are right there on the doorstep of releasing a new book, mm-hmm. which I was fortunate enough to get a preview copy of and, and read through. And it was one of those where I, I was like, okay, I'm just going to do three more pages. And then I found myself reading 10 more pages. And I'm like, okay, I can just do five more pages because it's really engaging. And, and the title the title itself, Mean People Suck. <laughs> I don't disagree. Yeah. Uh, so talk to me about that. Mean People Suck. And then this is how empathy leads to bigger profits and a better life. And of course, with what I've been writing about lately, a better life definitely intrigues me. But what is the antithesis of this book? Give us the background. Yeah, I mean, it's I, it's it's really funny. I think the parallel paths that we've been leading, Carlos, in your book, The Un American Dream, I think you know gets to a, a similar ethos. I think that we're all feeling, and it's this. I guess it's a feeling, really, that I think the world has just gotten a little bit, sh- you know, if I'm allowed to say that. You know, I think you talk to people and ask them how they're doing, how their job's going, and you know, people say, "Oh, you know, my boss is a jerk, and my company sucks," and you know, we're just not happy. <laughs> 
Right. And, and, you know, what happened for me was I was looking, you know, I start the book with a little tidbit on the 53. I actually looked back at my career and I realized that 50, I had 53 different roles. I'm starting back when I was, when I was about uh, 12 years old, I started as a paper boy and, um, you know, customer service jobs through high school and college and, and then, you know, professional roles and promotions are, you know, included in that. But, but I was like 53 jobs, what the heck? And, and I was miserable in most of them. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and my first is, so there's, there's two, I think, counterintuitive points in the title. First, mean people suck. Sounds like, uh, I think everybody can relate to that. But, but what I actually talk about in the book is it, it doesn't serve any of us to wallow in our misery. Uh, we have to take accountability and take action. That's number one. And the second thing is the secret I found on, you know, under all of this is empathy. And empathy is this counterintuitive uh, sort of secret to success because when we think of em- empathy, we're talking about you know, feeling what other people might be going through. And so how does that help us succeed? Well, it helps us to get out of our own head and get out of our own way and really start to think about how can I serve others? And it's only in that service of others that that we start to see the return and the the meaning and the impact that we all want to to see in our in our careers is kind of you know it's a professional book it's a business book but mm-hmm. i think there's a lot of takeaways for our personal lives as well yeah i mean having having read it and i do appreciate the advanced copy that that you mm-hmm. gave me i would agree i i think i read this and i was like wow this kind of straddles the line between business and just personal so mm-hmm. you talk about empathy you've written a lot about empathy when we talk about B two B, you know, we're we're talking about selling to accounts, and and we don't refer to people, we refer to buyers, we refer to customers. We come up with all of these very sterile terms to discuss who we're uh, going after from either a marketing or a sales perspective. So this whole idea and this move towards empathy has me really intrigued, and so unpack that a little bit for me. Like, how does an organization say either through our content, our tactics, even our sales process, we're going to be empathetic. And mm-hmm. how do we how do we show that? Yeah. Well, and this is this is kind of how I got to writing a book that's not about B2B or, you know, I'm a I'm a content marketing consultant. It's I don't even mention content marketing in the book. Is because what I've learned, it took me a long time to try to figure out why so much of our marketing sucks in B2B. And as a former salesperson, I learned early on, at least for me as a salesperson, pushing product didn't work. What I found, and I tell the story in the book, was that when I sit down, when I sat down with my first customer, and he actually had, I tell the story, he was colorblind, and, and it was in the early 90s, believe it or not. So, you know, computers and email were kind of new, and this guy couldn't see half this stuff on his screen, and I helped him. I, you know, I'm like, oh, this is how you open a Word document, it's how you attach it to email. And it was like, we became, like, I became his best friend. And only mm-hmm. through that emotional connection, that relationship, was I able to, to you know, I actually doubled, I think, and then ultimately tripled the revenue from that one account. Buildings don't buy software is, you know, something that we used to talk about at SAP. People Mm -hmm. do. And, you know, people buy from people they like and, you know, at best and, and, or people that they trust at, you know, at a minimum. And so how does an organization be empathetic? It's the culture of empathy is absolutely required in order to fight that natural tendency of the whole business, not just salespeople, not just marketing people, but the whole business. People show up, I think, they walk inside their buildings and they think all of a sudden they're a little less human and they're a little bit more robotic and their job is to promote the company. We got to talk about who we are and what we sell and why we're better. And that's exactly what, as consumers, we all know that that's what we tune out. We even hate it. I mean, I love the quote from the Advertising Research Foundation that shows that <laughs> that after 40 ad impressions for a single brand in a month, so that's just over one per day, mm-hmm. sales of that brand go down. The wow. act, the natural instinct to try to promote actually causes us to sell less, to lose customers. So it's the opposite. It's the thinking and feeling like, you know, what is my customer actually going through? What are the problems that they face? I love to talk about customer profiles and I say, marinate in their pain. You know, think about Cindy, you know, the CEO of a small company who, you know, wakes up in the middle of the night worried about payroll. Well, how can we help her? And and those are the kinds of things that sometimes don't relate to our products and our services in B2B. But it's the people that are making the buying decisions. So let's talk to them. Let's, let's really try to understand what they're going through. So again, it's counterintuitive. 
it's the you know the act of fighting against this natural instinct to promote and to sell um, is right. actually what starts to you know endear us to the people that we're trying to get to buy our products. And I love that you're really focusing in on that that human element of uh, and I like that uh, buildings don't buy software. You're exactly <laughs> right. And I I've talked to people and say let's let's even bring it down. You may be encountering it from a sales perspective that individual who on that day left their house and is struggling in their relationship or Mm -hmm. spilled their coffee or got a ticket on the way in. It's even those little things and changing the dynamic instead of saying, how could you have done that to what happened to cause you to have that reaction or, you know, bring this out in you. So when we talk about empathy, and again, I love the, the idea and, and of just being kind. Mm-hmm. And having kindness in our dialogue, and and I agree with you. I think as a society, especially if you look at social media, um, mm-hmm. the vitriol that comes out. So from a from a kindness perspective, what kind of research did you uh, do? You have any companies that you can point to and say this is a company that embraces empathy and embraces kindness in how they relate to their customers, and this is what it what the benefit. Did you were you able to go that deep in some of your research? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we we found, uh, gosh, I think there's probably six or seven really interesting case studies of companies that, you know, I, I it almost like I think in each in each instance I, I mentioned in the book, like, hey, I realize that there's probably an instance someone can point to of this company not being kind. <laughs> and you know, one of the first ones I talk about is is uh, Microsoft and Satya Nadella, who shares very publicly his own personal story of having a a child. I think twenty maybe fifteen years ago now that um, who was born with uh, with you know some some health issues and mm-hmm. and how him and his wife really had to kind of see the world a little bit differently. You know, with through empathy. And how, as a young man, and now you know, now the CEO of, of Microsoft, and when he became the CEO of Microsoft, he brought that sort of feeling that empathy can, the kindness can really help. And they, you know, they changed the mission. I, I talk about almost every story in every case study. There's a, a redirection of the mission of the company, and so you know, I think it's really interesting that what Satya did for Microsoft was he changed the mission to. Um, I think it's some. I'm paraphrasing, but it's something like empowering every person on the planet to achieve more or achieve their potential. It's a completely other. You know, it's totally focused on other people. It's not at all about Microsoft becoming the number one technology provider of anything. And he talked about how they wanted to become a learning organization. And so, you know, kindness sometimes isn't enough. It it really, you have to really go that extra step towards empathy of really trying to understand what is it that I don't understand? How do I listen better? And so, you know, in the book, the sort of the tagline for for the Mean People Suck brand is be kind, be cool, be you. And, you know, the, the reason I came to that was, you know, there's really five steps that I end the book with, but it, it, they really encapsulate down to, it starts with kindness and listening and focusing on others. But, and you got to this, you know, when you encounter somebody that's having a bad day, uh, be cool. You know, it's not about you. Don't take it personally. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's kind of the point there, you know, if we're optimistic and, and we're, you know, grateful for the things that we have. I actually relate to the story of a dinner I was having with Anne Hanley and John Hall, you know, some folks who are really well known here in the B2B space. And we were talking about people that love to complain about airlines. And and I was like, you know, half the complaints that you hear are because of the weather and people that just had a bad day. Good people, you know, and, and so yeah. sometimes, sometimes let's just let's just, you know, let's just be cool. <laughs> hey, can, um, can real quick confession. Yeah. I used to be that guy who complained on airline. So if my name came up at that dinner, guilty as charged. <laughs> well, I, I, it was a teachable moment, you know, and, and we're, we're all, hey, I think I say in the book as well, I suck too. You know, we all, right. we all have our bad days. And, and, sure. and so, you know, that's why I think finding that, that ability to be grateful and uh, Ariane Huffington calls it the micro moments, you know, taking just a little bit of time every day to be grateful you know, so it's it's more than just kindness. It's empathy. It's listening. It's not taking things personally. Being grateful, and then ultimately finding your purpose. That's the bu. And and I kind of end the book with this conversation on ikigai, which is a Japanese term for finding your purpose in life or your reason for waking up in the morning. And and you know, I think if we all do those things, those three things, I think this whole world could be a different place. And and you know, I don't have that aspiration for the book that we're going to totally change the world. But if we can if we can bring kindness, I think to a few more people, I think it would. Be good things. Yeah, I don't disagree. And you know, to me, I, I look at changing the world is um, very few people have had 
you know, short of maybe Jesus, Mother Teresa, and a handful of others have, have had that impact. But I do think we can change. When I talk about changing the world, the world that I live in, the world for mm-hmm. my kids, the world for my colleagues. And, and I really think this book is going to have have an impact. So we've talked about empathy and kindness. Where, and maybe I'm just parsing words now and getting a little bit too granular uh, for my own good. Where does compassion because it's one thing for me to associate with what you're feeling, mm-hmm. but does compassion from your perspective and what you've we've worked on, does compassion take that the extra mile? Is it right next to empathy? Where does compassion, because I, I, I feel we live in a world that is completely void of compassion. So I think what compassion is, it's understanding that other people are in pain. And it's a little bit different for me than than, than empathy. For me, empathy is, is really trying to, you know, as people say, walk a mile in, in someone's shoes. Compassion for me really starts to relate to the fact that it's the human condition. And, and I think it's, I don't know, I, I'm not uh, big into semantics, but I do think there's a slight difference between empathy which is probably more generically trying to understand what people are going through and compassion, which is, you know, uh, is somebody that doesn't have what you have, somebody that is suffering in some way and, and, you know, the fears and the, you know, anxieties that we all face. That's where I think compassion comes in. I definitely talk about compassion in, in the book in a couple of different instances and mainly one of the things that I, I try to recommend leaders do is to, uh, you know, kind of, it really does get to compassion, I think, for the fact that as a leader, you almost have to have to reach down and lift your employees up. Mm-hmm. And I talk about champion leaders. Champion leaders are ones that do that. And I provide a simple framework for doing it. It's just ask your team what they think. You know, it's not your job to tell people what to do when you're a leader. It's your job to ask your team what they think you should do. And and it's like the, again, counterintuitive. It's the opposite of what I think most leaders think their job is, but it, it requires that compassion, you know, for when you're in a position of authority to actually reach down. And, and, you know, I think when you think of compassion, that's what we think of, I think, is reaching down and picking somebody up. Yeah, I love that response. So you talked about managers and asking their teams, what is the danger? Because I've worked in a lot of jobs and I've had managers who truly did value what I thought, my input, and would make decisions based on that. Now, of course, not everything went my way, but you knew that you were a valued team member, that your thoughts, your process, whatever you wanted to contribute was encouraged. But you, I've also worked for bosses who spoke a good game, but their follow-through sucked. Mm-hmm. So what is the danger there? What does that do to a culture of empathy where all it is is lip service? Well, that, you know, that's exactly what uh, Satya talks about at Microsoft. And there are still people that complain about the culture of Microsoft. And what, <laughs> what, he, what he says is, hey, I realize that this is a process. And, and one of the things that they found, and it's funny because uh, um, Steve Lucas from Marketo is in the book. And, and the quote that he gave me, the endorsement is, um, uh, oh gosh, I, I'm going to have to find it. But he basically talks about how the days of, uh, because of the brilliant jerk, it's time to eliminate the brilliant jerk from our corporate uh, Amen. environment. Amen. That's exactly what Satya talked about. And and so the research I talk about in the book, there, there's research that showed that the biggest predictor of employee satisfaction is not pay or benefits. It's actually when promotions and raises are handed out fairly. Mm-hmm. That's what Satya talked about in his transformation of the culture at Microsoft was finding the leaders that were not respecting their team. So, you know, there was some Me Too stuff going on that that uh-huh. hadn't been addressed and he addressed it immediately. But then they also looked at how do they how do they dole out promotions and raises because he realized that that's what sends the signal through the organization. Is this an empathetic leader or is this a jerk, a brilliant jerk? And yeah. and uh, there was an article just a couple of days ago about um you know, the culture at Google is suffering because they they uh, Eric Schmidt called them brilliant aberrant geniuses. Mm -hmm. They allowed a culture of aberrant geniuses. By aberrant, we're talking about people that were, you know, sexually harassing others. Mm -hmm. And they allowed those people to continue to work there because they were, they were geniuses. And, and, you know, those are the kinds of small, you know, maybe seemingly insignificant signals that leaders have to understand. They have to, they have to, you know, stamp that out immediately. And so, you know, when we t- I talk about Steve Lucas, I talked about Satya Nadella in the book. There's other examples. There's a, a woman named Ann Donovan from a small company in Portland, Oregon. They're a, an HR benefits company, and their mission is to create great employees or great employers. 
Mm-hmm. So they're, it's interesting because their mission as an HR company is to sell software. You know, that's what they sell. But they see their mission as creating great employers, which is, it's, it's funny because you think about it. That's great for them. It's great for the, for the company they serve. It's great for the employees of the companies they serve. It's a, it's a virtuous cycle, not a negative yeah. one. And, and those leaders are just too few and far between these days. And that's, you know, part of why I wrote the book. Yeah, I would agree with that 100%. And I think when you see a company that's actually, you know, you look at Microsoft, goodness gracious, how big they are, Mm -hmm. that culture changes years in the Mm -hmm. making. You also talk about, though, self-reflection. And I'm Mm -hmm. glad you did because I think, and you mentioned it at the early part of our conversation, the personal responsibility that Mm -hmm. I have and I wrote about that is, and Sean Aker talks quite a bit about how our happiness and our contentment and our joy is really a choice mm-hmm. that, that I have to make, even in light of negative circumstances, which all of us who have lived uh, any length of time have had negative circumstances and hardship in our lives. So walk me through, talk a little bit about that self-reflection, because there is nothing worse than a perpetual victim. When everybody else knows, hey, things are moving for the better, you still have... I mean, Saturday Night Live did a whole sketch on it, right? The (laughs) the, the Debbie Downer type of person. So so for those people who are sitting there going, yeah, Michael, you don't understand my company, you don't understand my boss, what role does self-reflection play? And then is that uh, practice discipline? Just kind of go to town on that one. Well, it's it, it, like you said. It, it was part of the, part of the irony of the title. Mean people suck. Is I wanted to every I wanted to get everybody to nod their heads, but then smack them in you know smack them in the face with a two by four a little bit because you know guess what if you think other people suck you're the problem, mm-hmm. and and we need to be accountable. So you know this, Carlos, but your audience may not. As a speaker, my most tweeted quote is behind every bad marketing idea is an executive who asked for it. Do you know how many presentations I use that in? <laughs> and I actually give you credit for it. Thanks. So, I appreciate it. Yeah. So I speak and you get tweeted. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we all have to support each other. That's it's, right. Uh, it's a brotherhood. But the, the next thing I say, so that usually gets people nodding and laughing and, t- and retweeting, obviously. But um, the next thing I say is, but you know, it's easy to point the finger at the boss mm-hmm. or the company yeah. or your customers. We're the ones that do all the crap. We're the ones that do the stuff that doesn't work or do, the, you know, we're the ones that show up to the jobs that we hate. And so we have to be accountable for changing the situation. So I, the reflection starts number one with taking accountability. And that's, that's part of the irony of the title. But then, I, you know, I offer an outline in the book for how to go through that reflection. So it starts by taking accountability and thinking about how we can serve others. And, you know, like I said, not taking things personally, but then there's a whole process of, of, you know, thinking through, I call it the secret of life, but, you know, I thought I was coming up with an original term, but this guy, Dan Butner, Dan Butner in Blue Zones has covered the whole thing in, in his book, in his research on happiness. And it was all figuring out what is it that I know? What is it that the world would pay me for? What is it that the world wants? And then uh, what is it that the world actually needs? And that, that was the last piece that I hadn't actually thought about. So, you know, you could be a serial killer and maybe the world could use, uh, you know, a little, <laughs> a little less humanity in it. I don't know. I'm, I'm trying to take a pretty a bad, dark here. <laughs> I'm trying to take a bad analogy to a dark place. But, but the point is, it's not enough to do stuff that the world needs or that the world wants. The world has to actually need it, and so that it brings in this element, maybe of compassion, but of, d- of doing right by the world and and making an impact, not just for your own sake, but for other people. And so those are the four questions of reflection is, you know, what is it that I know? What is it that people would pay me for? What does the world want? And what does the world need? And those are the four elements of, of kind of reflection that I offer up. And I, I would maybe even offer another one is then what role can I play in that? Because I may not be able to address all the things the world needs, but the world mm-hmm. definitely needs. I mean, there's never... My wife always says there's never a reason to not be kind. That's right. So when you, I mean, just drive down a busy interstate and watch people get aggravated, you know, the number of middle, if I had a dollar for every middle finger up and back (laughs) to Denver, you know, I could, I could be a rich man and they're not, and just to be clear, they're not mine that I'm giving. (laughs) Um, But it it is, it's just, we're so stressed. So what's interesting to me in, in reading through your book and then just, you know, hearing you talk Marketing Profs came out and sponsored the, the Marketing Happiness Report. And I read it, and as a two-plus-decade B2B marketer, I got to tell you, it made me sad. 
<laughs> because it showed that only, I believe it was only 49%, and I'm going trying to go from memory, which is not always the greatest thing, but only 49% of marketers said they're fulfilled mm-hmm. in their work. And if you break that apart, there was only a 10% that said, I'm very fulfilled mm-hmm. in my work. Yeah. And I'm sitting there going, you know, we spend so much time working. So is it possible to have a sucky boss or a sucky job? so to speak, but still find fulfillment? I mean, I, th- I think so. But I think you have to accept your role as a change agent, which is not something everybody can do, or leave. And, and I think that's part of the advice I offer in, in the book. And, and the marketing profs data is a little bit more optimistic than mine. I, the survey I ran was just, you know, are you happy, are you miserable, or are you somewhere in the between? And it was 2% of people were happy in their jobs. 8% were miserable. Wow. And the, the, you know, the, the other 90% were in between. And what's interesting, I also asked two more questions. I asked, do you have a manager who supports you and your ideas? Mm-hmm. And the third question, which is really interesting, is do you feel like you work at an innovative company? Now, all these things are self-reported, so take it with a right. somewhat grain of salt. But what was really interesting is not a single happy person with a supportive manager worked at an innovative company. So in other words, and this gets to the accountability and the change agent nature, if you want to have an impact and be fulfilled in your career, you have to be working in an environment where your ideas are supportive. And if you have that, you are more likely by 20 times to work at an innovative company. So to to make an impact, a real impact in the world. And so think about that. You know, 2% of people are happy. Of them, I I forget the number, but I think it's like 77%. I'm just looking at my notes. 77% of the people that are happy have what they call supportive managers. And like I said, and then those people are 20 times more likely to be working at a company that they feel is changing the world. So, you know, think about that. So you either need to change the environment. I I talk about what I call the pushback in, and I tell a great story of of, uh, Rena Patel at Capgemini who pushed back on some bad ideas and started to change the whole culture of the company. Uh, I tell the story of Amanda Todorovich from Cleveland Clinic, who changed the entire culture of her company as a new employee by pushing back and focusing on empathy. So, you know, you have to either take on that mantle of, of changing, you know, changing with some small, simple steps or, you know, again, Ariana Huffington's micro moments or you have to leave. Uh, and, you know, because life, I, I think I end the, the intro is that life's too short to be miserable. You know, why would you choose that? Let's, you know, we have the, we have a short amount of time on this on this earth. Let's at least uh, find an environment where we can grow. So on that, there's there's two two things I want to follow up and ask. It's interesting that you talk about leaving because I have said that from the platform where people say, "Yeah, you don't understand," and I'm like, "So leave." Mm-hmm. So why do people stay? I was just talking to an individual this week, and it was he was recounting for me. You know, oh, I'm not happy. I'm this. I'm that. And, and I finally just said. So, dude, what are you still doing there? Yeah. Like, and literally, it was, well, there's comfort. And I'm like, there's comfort in misery? Mm-hmm. I'm like, I understand that there's risk in the unknown, but you've just detailed 10 minutes of how miserable you are. Yeah. So why do people st- why, why do people stay? Why do people not? Because to me, that's part of that self-reflection of, oh, I mean, we all have the ability for to be fluid in our jobs. Why do people stick that out and put up with this stuff? Yeah, it's pure. I mean, it's pure victim mentality, and I think this gets into a lot of you know of of what you covered in in the Un American Dream, and 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 I I can't remember if you said this or if I read it somewhere else. It, it, it if it's you. brilliant, I said it. <laughs> I think I think you said it, but it was basically you know like we we take a job and we spend more time caring about what our boss thinks than what our wife thinks, and that's mm-hmm. crazy. Right, yeah. you know, you, you commit to to spend your life with with this with your spouse, and you put their needs behind the needs of some jerk who's trying to tell you what to do and thinks you're an idiot. Like, right. it makes absolutely no sense that that we do that. It's pure victim mentality. And and another thing, a, a myth that I talk about in the book is this this sort of worship of the organizational hierarchy, yeah. and how I think the org chart is part of the problem of of you know the victim mentality that I think a lot of people have is we think our job is to show up and be told what to do. And that's the exact opposite of what we're, we should be doing. We should be showing up and telling telling the company what, what the company should be doing. We, we have you know intelligent brains and we have experience and we should bring that to the companies we work for, not show up, turn off our brains and just you know take, take orders from somebody above us. Right. And so, yeah, I think that's step one is taking accountability. 
So you you just touched on something too, and you referenced a f- couple of individuals who in their companies. So while I, to- I totally believe leadership should get behind culture change and adopt this, what I think I heard you say was, even as an individual contributor, mm-hmm. you not only could you, you should be making a huge impact in your in your company, and you can lead where you're at by simply applying some of these principles. That's is that right. what you is that what you're finding and, and encouraging? That's absolutely. I mean, one of the biggest objections I've heard with this concept is, you know, like like you said, I'm I'm just a cog in the wheel. I'm a, I'm a you know low level employee. How can I? really implement change. And and what we're starting to see, and this is true in marketing, and I'm seeing it with what I call employee activation, where you know companies that try to market themselves aren't really seeing the success that companies that just simply activate their already engaged employees to tell stories. That that's the most effective marketing today. That really, it's really a it's a democratic message. It's a the power is in the people. And, right. and so, you know, I tell the story, like I said, Rena Patel was at Capgemini and uh, a couple of years ago, she was leading their digital marketing efforts and their CEO said, I want to sponsor a golfer and I want to give you $20 million. And she said, no. And mm. she said, I don't, I don't think our audience, uh, enough of them care about golfers. And I think we'd be wasting our money. I don't know how we'd measure success, but if you give me 0.1% of that budget, I think I can make a real impact. And and so I tell her amazing story, you know, and, and it was, she was a, a relatively low level employee compared to the CEO. And, yeah. and she, you know, just through the simple act of not just pushing back, like, you know, in a rebellious way, she just, she just pointed out the flaws in the thinking that led to the, to led to the idea to sponsor golf and, you know, put all that money there, you know, and so every individual can make, can make a change. And, and just by asking, you know, why are we doing this and how are we going to measure it? It just, those two simple questions can, can really start to uh, implement a change across an organization. I love that. I personally get so tired of, I'm just an individual contributor Mm -hmm. kind of excuse that just tells me, okay, you're not willing to work a little harder. Mm-hmm. Uh, to drive effective change. So one one last question for you before I ask you to kind of let people know where they can find you and, f- mm-hmm. and find a book because I know it goes on, uh, on pre-sale here pretty soon, at least at the mm-hmm. time of this recording. I'm now hooked on the message and I go, okay, great. And, and this is more of a self-reflection moment for me because I, I think if you had run into me three years ago, four years ago, and thankfully I had some colleagues, I, I can't remember if you were one, but if you were, I thank you for it. Who would say to me sometimes, man, you're writing your posture on social media comes across really angry. So I would have put myself in that, in that mean people. And I did. I, I railed against everything. And what I, what I was able to find was I just really wasn't satisfied with myself. Right. And so a lot of work. So if I'm, if I'm in that place mm-hmm. and I say, yeah, I want to do that, but I find myself getting agitated. I go to social media to rant and rave about anything, which I still do about the New York Yankees every once in a while, but that's <laughs> legitimate. Where do you start as an individual to say, because I, I don't think it's just you wake up one morning and go, oh, okay, I'm going to change now. Mm-hmm. I know for me, I had to do a lot of work and it sucked mm-hmm. and it was hard because you really have to look at some of the ugly parts of yourself. But I can say I'm much better for it. And I'm not saying I don't have bad days. I do, but life for me just is viewed through such a different positive. But how have you experienced that? How have you seen people saying, I'm going to get out of this angry mode or mean mode and actually be a person that shows kindness, empathy, and compassion? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I think the transformation, and maybe this, you know, maybe this happened for you, but I think for most people, the transformation from feeling like you're in a situation and life sucks in some way is that it's your fault. It's, you know, denial ain't no river in Egypt, as I like to say. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, if, if, you, if you are pointing the finger at your boss, your, your company, your spouse, whatever situation you were born into, if you're pointing the finger at those things, you are in denial. Mm-hmm. Uh, like you said, happiness is a choice. So the transformation starts with it is your fault. So I have to say, and, and I'm, I'm assuming you came to the realization at some point that you were the one behind some of that anger. It was your fault, right? It was oh, not, yeah. it was not uh, your, your job or your spouse or your, uh, you know, situation in life. It was you. Yep. And, and, you know, and I've been there many times and I'm, you know, there, we all have our, the things that we're, you know, constantly moving through. So it starts with just this accountability and acceptance, you know, that we need to take the responsibility for, for being happy and, and for making a difference and making an impact. And once you do that, I, what I found, and I don't know if this is true for everyone, I'm not a, I'm not a, you know, a self-help guru, but is 
is gratitude is the road that got me out of, uh, you know, I think can get us out of that feeling, that place of, of misery. Just counting your blessings or whatever term you want to use, you know, thanking God, whatever, whatever you do to try to focus on the things that you're lucky to have, you know, your health, your spouse, your kids, your house, you know, I mean, the simplest things we, we all should be grateful for. To me, that's the path, that's the road out, but it starts with the light bulb moment of, of acceptance that it's your fault. Yeah. And that's not it. Sometimes that's, that's a hard thing to get mm-hmm. to. Yep. But but I do agree. And it's it's something I used to say to my kids all the time is, hey, you know, you've had three arguments today with your siblings. Mm-hmm. They've not argued with each other. There's a common denominator. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and the common denominator is you. And I did have to apply that to myself. Uh, glad I did. And I still do, right? It's I don't think we ever quote unquote arrive. Mm-hmm. Um, I am so, so excited about this book. I love the title. As a matter of fact, I remember when you sent me the the title, I burst out laughing. I was like, this is fantastic because yeah, mean people do suck. Mm-hmm. And I love that it's, it's for me, it's more than a marketing book. Um, I think marketers will take a lot away from this because you put a lot of great case studies in there, some of which you've referenced. But I think it's just a life book of yeah. how can we just be better people? And for God's sake, can we just be kind and and accept that nobody, not everybody's going to see the world through our lens and mm-hmm. that's okay. Yeah. So I love that you do that. So for those who are listening, where can they find you? Where can they get access to the book? How do they find out more about it? Yeah, definitely. I, uh, head on over to uh, meanpeoplesuck.com. We just uh, just launched the website uh, yesterday. And so you can sign up for the newsletter or check out, I've got some merchandise on there. We're testing some some t-shirts uh, and stickers. If it's after September 4th, you can certainly order on pre-sale. I've got a couple of incentives. I'm going to give away my, my last two books, The Content Formula and Digital Marketing Growth Hacks, uh, PDF version, as well as a companion audio uh, audiobook guide. And um, you can get me on Twitter at Brenner Michael, you can follow Mean People Suck on Instagram, uh, and would love to hear your story. If any of your audience is interested in telling me a story of how they've kind of transformed their lives or their company cultures or themselves as leaders, I'd love to hear their story. You know, just reach out to me, and, and maybe we can share that. And in addition, you'll be at several of the upcoming conferences that uh, kind of close out the year, starting in September. Correct? That's right. Content Marketing World and Marketing Profs B two B Forum, uh, to name a few. Awesome. Michael, always great talking to you. Uh, Really an honor to just sit down and talk about this. I love the research. I think it's sorely needed in marketing and B2B, just in humanity in our society. So thanks for Thanks for writing it. I really, I, I mean that. I think I know what it takes to write one. I haven't just done one myself. And um, I think this one is is a winner. So I highly recommend it. And I uh, look forward to uh, continuing to watch this journey and cheering you on from the cheap seats. Yeah, thanks so much, Carlos. It's like giving birth, you know, uh, when, you, when you launch a book, you, you're exhausted, but you're thrilled at the thing you created. So uh, we've both been through it. So thanks so much for, for giving me this platform to talk about it. Absolutely. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks. All right. Well, thanks to our listeners for listening to the B2B Growth Podcast, the human to human segment, and make sure that you turn into more of the B2B Growth Podcast segments that can be found uh, on the B2B Growth Show. I'm Carlos Hidalgo. We're going to wrap this up for the day. And be kind, be cool, and be you. We totally get it. We publish a ton of content on this podcast, and it can be a lot to keep up with. That's why we've started the B2B Growth Big Three, a no-fluff email that boils down our three biggest takeaways from an entire week of episodes. Sign up today at sweetfishmedia.com slash big three. That's sweetfishmedia.com slash big three.